Carr. De La Rosa. Here. Dinowitz. Here. Farias. Present. Feliz. Presente. Gennaro. Gutierrez. Hanif. Here. Hanks. Present. Holden. Here. Hudson. Present. Joseph. Present. Kagan. Present. Krishnan. Here. Lee. Here. Lewis. Present. Marte. Present. Mealy. Menon. Present. Moya. Present. Narcisse. Present. Nurse. Ose. Present. Paladino. Present. Wrestler. Yes. Richardson Jordan. Riley. Present. Rivera. Salamanca. Sanchez. Present. Shulman. Here. Stevens. Here. Ung. Present. Velasquez. Present. Vernikoff. Present. Williams. I'm here. Carr. Juan. Present. Jaeger. Here. Borelli. Present. Powers. Present. Speaker Adams. Present. It's the majority of you. We have a quorum. Thank you. We'll now have today's invocation, which will be delivered by Imam Khalid Latif, the chaplain and executive director of the Islamic Center at New York University, located at 238 Thompson Street in Manhattan. Let us pray. Almighty God, giver of life and guider of hearts, bless this gathering and all those who are in it. Assembled here today are men and women who have dedicated their lives to working in service of others. Increase each of us in all that is good and make us a continued source of benefit for your creation. Make us New Yorkers who value people over profit. As we find ourselves in the midst of the month of Ramadan, instill within each of us the ethic that the month builds itself upon. Make our pursuits pursuits rooted in love, motivated by an unconditional compassion, and manifest in acts of mercy intended to achieve nothing other than a common good. Let us never be those who a hope of gaining some part of this world or a fear of losing some aspect of it causes us to deny the rights of others. Help us to never fear the path of truth for the lack of people walking on it and bless us to be leaders and to have leaders to follow who walk firmly upon it. Let our unity be not tied to uniformity of the external, our race, our ethnicity, our class, but instead make us brothers and sisters of all backgrounds in our unity based on a uniformity of our values and hearts. Remove from our hearts any negative thoughts of others and help us to never partake in acts of injustice against people of any background. Let our anger be only at injustice, oppression, and exploitation of people so that we will work for justice, equality, and peace. Let our tears shed only for those who suffer from pain, rejection, starvation, and conflict so that we will reach out our hands to comfort them and change their pain into joy. And let our successes be many as we make a difference in this world by doing the things which others say cannot be done. A special prayer for our brothers and sisters in Sunset Park and for all of Brooklyn. Guide the footsteps of all those who were impacted by the atrocious, tragic act of violence that happened in our city not long ago. 
Deepen us in our trust, love, and care for them and each other so that we might come together to help them at this time. Send them only those who will be their helpers and supporters and protect them from any further affliction, anxiety, or anguish. Grant them peace, relax their fears, and remove from them any impediment that keeps them from doing all that they are able to do. Open the hearts of their, in their chests to receive all of the love that we are sending them on this day and envelop Brooklyn in your divine love always. Watch over this city and through us bring strength to your creation. Help us to be the reason people have hope in this world and never the reason that people might dread it. Protect us always from hearts that are not humble, tongues that are not wise, and eyes that have forgotten how to cry. Forgive us for our shortcomings and guide and bless us all. Amen. Thank you. Uh, we're going to ask Councilmember Chris Marte to spread the invocation, and then we're going to have Councilmember Hanif to make brief remarks. Uh, thank you, Majority of Powers. I'd like to thank Iman Khalid Latif for being here today, and I want to make a motion for unanimous consent to spread the invocation in full upon the record. And now I pass it off to my colleague, uh, Councilmember Hanif. Thank you so much. Asalaamu <clears throat> As Alaikum and Ramadan Mubarak. I'm so honored to host. Imam Khalid Latif today and during this beautiful month of Ramadan. Imam Khalid is the university chaplain for New York University and executive director of the Islamic Center at NYU. He was appointed the first Muslim chaplain at NYU in 2005. He was also appointed the first Muslim chaplain at Princeton University in 2006. Spending a year commuting between these two institutions, he finally decided to commit full time to New York University's Islamic Center, where his position was officially institutionalized in the spring of 2007. Under his leadership, the Islamic Center at NYU became the first ever established Muslim student center at an institution of higher education in the United States. This is important and one that this council should pay attention to. Imam Latif has not only managed to solidify the basis of a strong Muslim community at NYU that seeks to emphasize inclusiveness and understanding of others without compromise, but has also worked tirelessly to foster dialogue with people of other faiths in order to clarify misconceptions and encourage mutual education. Through his work, Imam Latif has demonstrated not only an exceptional dedication to gaining and disseminating religious knowledge and values, but has begun to carve out a much needed space for young American Muslims to celebrate their unique identity and have their voices heard in the larger public sphere. In 2019, Imam Latif co-founded and became the board president of Pillars of Peace, an NYC-based nonprofit established in order to address a gap in appropriate services for survivors of domestic and gender-based violence from all backgrounds, and in particular within the Muslim community. Pillars completed a successful $1 million capital campaign for the Noura House, an emergency confidential shelter for women and children in less than two weeks and is expected to open in the spring of 2022. He's also the co-founder of Honest Chops, the first ever organic halal butcher in NYC, and its spin-off restaurant Burgers by Honest Chops, a personal favorite. Ramadan is not an easy time for me and many Muslims who live with chronic illness and disabilities. Many Ramadans ago, I was on, on a search to find an inclusive, caring mosque in NYC one that recognizes women and folks with disabilities as leaders and prioritizes our experiences, ideas, and contributions. One that doesn't just offer a side entrance for women to pray and strengthen their faith. And I landed at the Islamic Center at NYU. Sure, it's in a private university, but it was the first time I felt welcomed and prayed seated on a chair alongside the diversity of Muslims in one room. This was a breath of fresh air for me in my faith journey because growing up, my sisters and I didn't have a faith space to continue to strengthen and learn about Islamic jurisprudence, organize in a post 9-11 New York City, and so much more. Now, so many new spaces have emerged and it gives me hope for the Muslims who have continued to be left out and on the margins. For me, Ramadan is a renewed opportunity to re redefine what feminist leadership, democracy, centering liberation, building a decarceral New York City, an anti-capitalist city means? How do we lead when our neighbors don't have the basics, feel unsafe? How do we cultivate joy in times of grief, polarization, and anger? 
The beauty of centering my faith is that this universe was built on justice, that the natural state of the universe is equity and dismantling oppression. We're all tasked with liberation, and I'm really proud of the ways my colleagues, all of us bearers of justice, continue to stand up for New Yorkers with care and compassion. Thank you, Imam Latif, for bringing and building a space so thoughtful and helping Muslims, especially young Muslims, young Muslim women who haven't felt safe in our neighborhoods to feel safe and protected in our city. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Haneev. We are now going to have the adoption of the minutes by City Councilmember Gail Brewer. Thank you. I am uh, stating that I'd like to move to spread the invocation in full upon the record. Uh, Sorry, I'd like to move that the minutes of the stated meeting of March 10th, 2022 be adopted as printed. Thank you very much. Good, thank you, Councilmember Brewer. Now I have messages and papers from the mayor. None. Communication from city, county, and borough offices. Pre-considered M's 46 and 47, budget modifications. Oh. Petitions and communications. Pre-considered. Okay, pre-considered M48, the EEPC annual report and communication. Received, ordered, printed, and filed. All right, now petitions and communications. None. Land use call-ups. None. Thank you. I also want to note that Councilmember Richardson Jordan is here and present on Zoom for attendance. Um, we are now going to move to communication from Speaker Adrian Adams. Thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Good afternoon, everyone. Happy Thursday and happy birthday, Council Member Crystal Hudson. <laughs> Just a quick reminder, masks are strongly encouraged to be worn throughout our stated meeting here in Chambers. We're still in the middle of a pandemic and we want to be as careful and safe as possible. That said, I really want to thank all of you for your kind words making me smile, your best wishes while I recovered from COVID. I'm really happy to say that I'm good, better than good and feeling great, actually. Um, I'm gr <laughs> thank you. <laughs> you know, um, I'm so grateful for vaccinations. And I have to let you know, um, vaccinations that potentially saved my life, and I know potentially saved some of your lives here in this room as well. It may have potentially, had they been available, saved the life of my own father, who passed away in March 2020 when we had no vaccinations available. So I'm thankful. I'm very thankful. Um, as a reminder to everyone, the pandemic isn't over. So please, please, please remember to remain vigilant, get tested, and get vaccinated and boosted if you haven't done so already. So today we're voting on one bill, one resolution, three finance resolutions, and one land use item. Before I begin, though, I want to officially congratulate Justin Katanji Brown Jackson on her confirmation to the Supreme Court of the United States. <laughs> Justice Jackson's historic appointment serves as an inspiration to young girls and women across the wor world, especially black and brown girls who may see themselves in her story. Justice Jackson's journey, her grace, and her powerful words moved me in so many ways. So congratulations to her once again, her beautiful family, and to all Americans who will benefit from her continued public service to this country. On Tuesday morning, a tragic incident occurred in our city that shook us to our core. Like all New Yorkers, I was horrified and saddened when I learned about the mass shooting inside of a Manhattan-bound N train heading towards the subway station in Sunset Park in Councilmember Avile's district. We've since learned that 10 people were shot inside the train, nearly two dozen people were injured, and many more escaped this terrifying act of violence. My heart is with the impacted individuals, their families, and all New Yorkers who endured the terror of that day. I want to thank the NYPD, our first responders, transit workers, and other law enforcement partners, and everyday New Yorkers who all played contributing roles that resulted in the apprehension of the person 
suspected of committing this cruel act. Once again, New Yorkers have stepped up and have shown compassion for one another. These heroic acts by our friends and neighbors likely saved lives. We also know that many New Yorkers have been traumatized by this extreme event and the continuing violence experienced in our communities and across the city. The trauma of the pandemic and resulting increase in violence in our city and across the country is compounding. There is the extreme incident of Tuesday, as well as the more common occurrences. I can't believe I'm actually saying this. The more common occurrences of violence that have similar impacts on communities and those harmed. Just hours after the shooting in Sunset Park, there were several other shootings in the city later on that night. Last Friday, a shooting in the Bronx took the life of a precious 16-year-old child. And across the entire country, including here in our city, hate violence has continued to relentlessly target our Asian American, Jewish, and Sikh communities and other communities in our city. Many New Yorkers are traumatized. We have to acknowledge that and address it. Too often, we talk about the victims of violence without actually providing the help that people need to recover and heal. When this type of trauma goes unaddressed, it only continues cycles of harm that destabilize people's lives and the communities where they live. It makes our neighborhoods and our city less safe. It is incumbent on the city to address this underlying trauma. As a city, we have a responsibility to provide mental health, trauma recovery, and victim services for survivors of violence. The Council is very focused on this in a variety of ways, and we are looking forward to do more. In the preliminary budget response, we are calling for the creation of at least one trauma recovery center in every borough, and more than one in other boroughs. This innovative model of victim services will reach survivors who are often left behind and don't receive the services that they need. Our young people, immigrants, communities of color, unhoused New Yorkers, and others all face different forms of violence but don't have access to the resources for recovery. In fact, victims of gun violence, particularly in communities of color, are often the least likely to receive victim services at all. Nationally, black men under the age of 35 who live in urban areas and have incomes below $25,000 a year are more likely to be victimized than any other group. Yet, they are the least likely to receive assistance from support programs. So, the least harmed are the least helped. Or the most harmed are the least helped. We cannot allow that to continue and it's important that all survivors get help. That's why the Council is proposing the creation of trauma recovery centers, which can provide culturally competent and community-based assistance. These centers of care bridge the gap and provide underserved victims and their families with the trauma-informed recovery support they deserve. Of course, there is more work to be done to address the proliferation of guns flowing into our city which is often the cause of harm and violence we've experienced. The federal government must take action to curb the mass distribution of these guns in our communities. We will continue to play our part by employing smart strategies that involve all stakeholders to keep New York City safe. Public safety requires a nuanced, multifaceted approach and the Council's preliminary budget response is focused on these solutions. Whether it's health and mental health care, affordable and supportive housing, youth programs, or more services for unhoused New Yorkers, we are putting forward investments that will result in a healthier, safer, and stronger community and communities across this city. This is what New Yorkers expect and deserve and we here in the New York City Council are ready to deliver results. This weekend, many New Yorkers of various faiths 
will be observing important holidays with their families and communities. Christians will be observing Good Friday tomorrow and Easter Sunday, or Resurrection Sunday, as some of us call it, on Sunday. Jewish New Yorkers will be celebrating Passover tomorrow and wishing our Muslim neighbors a blessed month of fasting in Ramadan Murar. To all New Yorkers who are celebrating major holidays this weekend, I wish you all a happy and safe gathering with your family, friends, and community. Now let's dive into our agenda for the day. We will be voting on the following land use item. 98-18 Queens Boulevard rezoning will facilitate a new 15-story mixed-use building with approximately 158 housing units, 40 units of which will be permanently affordable. The council will be modifying the application to ensure the lower income, mandatory inclusionary housing options apply in Council Member Shulman's district. Staff to thank is James Catone. Thank you, James. We will also be voting on three finance resolutions. The first is an expense budget modification that represents proposed movements of approximately $1.85 billion in city tax levy funds within and among city agencies. It reflects $1.1 billion in new federal funding received since the November plan and redistributes some of the program to eliminate the gap savings toward new needs. The second is a revenue budget modification that seeks to recognize $1.94 billion in new revenues. These revenues, when combined with $300 million in excess current year reserves and $400 million in the prior year payables, will furnish a total of $2.77 billion to be added to the budget stabilization account to prepay expenses in fiscal 2023. The third is a transparency resolution setting forth the new designation and changes in the designation of certain organizations receiving local, aging, anti-poverty, and youth discretionary funding and funding pursuant to certain initiatives in the budget. In addition, we're voting on two pieces of legislation regarding recent actions taken by the Report and Advisory Board Review Commission. Established by a charter amendment in 2010, this commission reviews reporting requirements established by local law and has the power, subject to the council's approval, to waive any requirement it deems no longer useful. Pre-considered resolution, sponsored by council member Sandra Ung, would disprove, disapprove the commission's recent waiver of the 9-11 response time report produced by the police department and the annual youth services report produced by the Department of Youth and Community Development. The resolution would also approve waivers of several other reports that are now outdated or redundant. Pre-considered introduction, also sponsored by Councilmember Ung, is a cleanup bill that removes language from the administrative code and charter that will be nullified by the passage of the resolution, and we thank our staff member, C.J. Murray, for your help with this. Thank you all for your attention. Now I'd like to turn it over to our majority leader. Thank you, Madam Speaker. And I wanted to just briefly, Councilmember Avilas wanted to speak about the Sunset Park shooting, so I want to call on her. This Tuesday, April 12th, my 16-year-old daughter left our home at 8.20, headed to the 36th Street train station for school. A citizen's app alert hit my phone as any mother, I immediately called her and told her be alert Within seconds, she called me back that she, people were running towards her. She was coming home. Like every parent, I miraculously made it to her and got her to safety. I returned to the scene just a few blocks from my home as the horrific details of what had transpired had just begun to emerge. Our Sunset Park community has experienced what too many Americans have experienced before us another senseless act of violence. While we are so deeply thankful that no casualties have occurred, we know 10 people suffered gunshot wounds and up to another 16 injured, countless of people in my community are traumatized. Yesterday, a parent recounted that as she was bringing her five-year-old child to school, he told her, mommy, please, 
they're gonna kill us. I don't want to go to school. Despite her broken heart and her own anxieties, she had to bring him to school because she would lose her job. She reassured him, you're gonna be okay, mijito. Their trauma is just now rearing its own ugly head. Our community is deeply shaken by yet another mass shooting. We are grateful to our first responders, to the transit workers, to the heroic fellow commuters who immediately sprung into action to help wounded victims rather than run for safety. Their actions likely saved lives. We are also thankful for our school principals whose quick response immediately ensured that students were safe and that the families were informed. I am personally thankful to all my colleagues in this body who immediately reached out to support me and to support our community. As I have said before, what our community needs right now, more than ever, is reassurance that we will not be abandoned in the aftermath of Tuesday's incident, that our pain will not be used as a scapegoat for policies that do not and won't keep us safe. We know that more police presence on the trains and in neighborhoods would not have prevented this. What we need is to cultivate true public safety and that is meaningful investment in social services, housing, healthcare, mental health services, and education. And just as urgently, we must stop the manufacturing and flow of guns in this country. And yes, I said that. Why do we as a country, a supposedly civilized society, feel more wedded to weapons of mass destruction than to our own health, safety, and well-being? This will never make sense to me. See, more than 40 years ago, I watched my father die in front of me when he was shot multiple times. And what have we done 40 years later? We produce more guns, we employ more police, and we have more mass shootings and ongoing back acts of violence. Every single day this country witnesses 321 people being shot. 22 children are shot on a daily basis in this country. And what do we do? We tinker around the edges, we do background checks, we create loopholes, and yet the flow of guns is unabated and the creation of profit from their sale is higher than ever. We must eradicate the guns. We have created an entire industry to manage the impacts and yet never disrupt its flow. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. Perhaps profiting off of guns seems to be so much more important to us than our own health lives and well-being. The equation is rather simple. We owe it to our children, to our families, to our neighbors. We must do the math, we must have courage, and we must do things differently. We are asking our partners in city, state, and federal government for multifaceted, effective, evidence-based public safety response, including abundant mental health resources for the victims in the near term, in addition to dramatic investments in violence prevention. Let us stop doing the same thing over and over again and get to the root causes of this situation. We need full, em full employment, guaranteed health care. We need housing. We need services. Invest in people. Stop, mass stop manufacturing weapons of mass destruction. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Vilas. Thank you for sharing those words with us. Uh, we're now going to move into our agenda for the day. We have the report of special committees. None. We have the reports of standing committees. Report of the Committee on Finance, pre-considered Reso 107, Transparency Reso. 
Cobbled on general orders. Pre-considered M46 and Reso 123 and M47 and Reso 124 budget modifications. Cobbled on general orders. Report of the Committee on Governmental Operations, pre-considered intro 205A and pre-considered Reso 120A, Report and Advisory Board Review Commission. Cobbled on general orders. LUs 20 through 25 and LUs 29 through 33, various rezonings. Approved with modifications and referred to the City Planning Commission pursuant to Section 197D of the New York City Charter. On the general orders calendar, LU 26 and Reso 125 and LU 27 and Reso 126, 9881 Queens Boulevard rezoning. Coupled on general orders, I would now ask that the clerk take a roll call vote on all of the items coupled on today's general orders calendar. Lewis. Aye on all. Thank you. Mealy. Abreu. Aye. Ariola. Aye on all except Reso 0120. Aviles. Aye on all. Ayala. Aye on all. Thank you. Baron. Can I be excused to explain my vote? Yep, go ahead. Well, I want to say uh, salam alaikum to um, Ramadan Mubarak, to my Muslim brothers and sisters, and I want to say happy Resurrection Sunday to my Christian brothers and sisters who celebrate the rise of the revolutionary black Messiah, Jesus Christ. I want to say thank you. Um, I'm voting no on LU 27 and 26. I think the 60 to over 60% market rate, uh, we could do better than that in our communities. And I want to vote no on Reso 123, the expense modification. The expense modification is calling for taking 1.1 billion away from city agencies that receive federal funding as though we should be punishing city agencies because they got federal funding and putting into a fund where the mayor can do different kinds of things with it. This is an austerity budget and the mayor continually uh, uses cuts and money when we actually have 6.1 billion in a rainy day budget and layaway money. And we had 1.9 billion come in more than expected, but yet we're still pushing an austerity budget with pegs and punishing agencies that receive federal funding as though that made up for the pegs and it didn't. So I vote no on Reso 123, the expense modification and I on all the rest. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Yes. I just want to say also to my, my sister from uh, Abelas, um, God bless you. You got a thousand percent support on all that you do. And I appreciate you speaking truth to power, even though you're in pain. Thank you, Councilmember. <clears throat> Councilmember Botcher. I on all. Brennan. I. Brewer. I on all. I want to congratulate Councilmember Ong on the government operations on the advisory boards. Um, in terms of uh, supporting two and making sure that others uh, are moved to the graveyard. But I do want to say in general, I would like to see a lot more discussion on the issue of advisory boards and whether or not the material is coming on a timely basis to the city council. Thank you very much. Brooks Powers. I on all. Caban. I on all. Car. Going to just disclose on the record that the budget related resolutions we're voting on today uh, fund CUNY, and I have a domestic partner who is a student at CUNY. And uh, with that said, I'm going to vote no on pre considered resolution 120A and I on the rest. Thank you. De La Rosa. Aye. Dinowitz. Aye on all. Thank you. Farias. I on all. Feliz. Aye. Gennaro. Aye. Gutierrez. Aye. Hanif. Aye on all. 
Hanks. Aye on all. Thank you. Holden. <coughs> Aye on all. Thank you. Hudson. Aye. Joseph. <coughs> Aye. Kagan. Aye. Krishnan. Aye on all. Thank you. Lee. Aye on all. Marte. Aye on all. Menon. Aye on all. Moya. I vote aye. Thank you. Narcisse. Aye on all. Nurse. Aye on all. Ose. Aye on all. Paladino. I and all except Rezo zero one two zero. Thank you. Restler. Aye. Richardson Jordan. I I would like to go. Um, I would like to abstain on LU twenty seven and twenty six and uh, I on the rest. Thank you. <clears throat> Riley. I don't know. Rivera. I would I. Salamanca. I don't know. Thank you. Sanchez. I don't know. Shulman. Permission to explain my vote? Go ahead. Uh, for <clears throat> I I and all, um, LU 26, Res 125, 98, 81 Queens Boulevard. I'm very pleased that one of the first land use actions in my district since I joined the council will create new, deeply affordable housing, one of the key priorities I campaigned on. I want to point out that it was uh, told to me by the land use that this is the first one in this district ever. Uh, the proposed project will bring over 50 new permanently affordable homes to Rigo Park in an environmentally sensitive building whose design acknowledges the site's past while looking towards the future. In addition, the developer agreed to and is in the process of pursuing environmentally friendly green building certifications and working on innovative bicycle spaces within the development. I would like to take the opportunity to thank Queens Community Board 6 and the Queensboro President for their insight and collaboration on this proposal as well as the land use staff who was instrumental in assisting me during this process, particularly James Catone. I also want to thank the applicant team for their willingness to engage with the community throughout the public review process to address community needs and concerns. This project demonstrates that working with the community can enhance rather than hinder good development for New York City. Thank you. Aye on all. Thank you. Stevens. Aye on all. Ung. I on all. Velasquez. I on all. Thank you. Yeah. Vernikov. I on all of Seth Brazil 120. <laughs> Thank you. Williams. Um, I just want to disclose my association with CUNY as a student, and I vote I on all. Juan. Aye on all. Thank you. Jaeger. <coughs> Aye. Mealy. <coughs> okay. Borelli. Aye on all except Rezo 0120. Powers. I vote aye, and I want to congratulate, I think, both council members, Ong and Williams, for passing their first bills today. Speaker Adams. I also congratulate my colleagues on the passage of their first bills before the council, and I do vote aye on all.
All items on today's general order calendar are adopted by a vote of 50 in the affirmative, zero in the negative, and zero abstentions, with the extension of Resolution 120, which was adopted by a vote of 45 in the affirmative, five in the negative, and zero abstentions, and pre-considered pre M46 and resolution accompanying Resolution M20, uh, Resolution 123, 49 in the affirmative, one in the negative, zero abstentions, and land use items 26 and 27 with accompanying resolutions, which were adopted by a vote of 48 in the affirmative, one in the negative, and one in the abstention. We're now gonna move on to the introduction and reading of bills. All bills have been referred to committees as indicated on today's agenda. Thank you, there are no resolutions on today's agenda. We're not gonna move into general discussion. I will note we have a very, very long list, so please, if you can, keep it to two minutes, and we'll have you on the clock. We're gonna start with, except for the minority leader, Joe Borelli, who by the rules of the city council does, I believe, get five minutes. Uh, we will now move to minority leader, Joe Borelli, who has agreed to only do two minutes. <laughs> <laughs> when you change the rules to include free ice cream like the state legislature, then I'll, I'll bend a bit. Uh, I rise today to speak about intro, uh, rather, Rezo 106. As of today, we have vaccines that have proven effective. We have natural immunity amongst so many of our citizens. We have methods of mitigating spread should we need them. And we have treatments that have proven to be tremendously effective given how far we've come since the spring of 2020. So why are we still operating in this state of emergency? How long can the executive branch, both here in the city, and in Albany, make laws without the consent and oversight of this body and the state legislature? When will the public have a say on rules that have the effect of law, have drastic ability to change lives? When will they get their say? The problem I have with the current private sector mandate and the public employee mandate is a question of equity. When something's not equal, this body has always stood, at the very least, for giving the public a say. We need to have a hearing on Intro 106 because for too long, our health officials in this city have come to this chamber sporadically and they've come here in their lab coats with their name and their fancy titles and their degrees next to their name, and they've dictated us. And that was fine for a while. But with the rates low, with the hospitalization rates tremendously low and the death rates low, how long must we operate in this scenario where this body doesn't have a say in laws that affect the lives of so many of our constituents? I suspect they don't want to come and talk about this resolution or about the mandates. Because despite the fancy lab coats, despite the fancy titles, they can't lecture us on equitable outcomes and equitable access and equitable treatment. When you create an exception for anyone, you lose the scientific high ground and you lose the moral authority. Exceptions for some is inherently equal. So I ask you colleagues, some of you have neighborhoods where attendance is schools is less than 50% regularly. Some of you have neighborhoods where sanitation doesn't do a great job of cleaning up. Some of you have neighborhoods with high crime. Some of you have neighborhoods where things burn down. Some of you have neighborhoods where the grass grows too high, and yet our rules are firing city workers who do those jobs, but made the same choice as athletes and performers who we now are excited are going to play. Now bear in mind you, the Yankees or whoever, have the best doctors money can buy. Does anyone dispute that? They're spending millions of dollars on someone's athletic performance and they don't have the best doctor's money can buy? No, of course they do. And those doctors are okay, apparently, with some of their players playing unvaccinated around players and staff who are. 
What does it also say long term for some of our constituents? Some of our neighborhoods have vaccination rates where 10%. 20% even. Some boroughs have a 10% rate of unvaccinated adults. We're saying that one out of every 10, one out of, uh, two, one out of every five in some neighborhoods, adults are ineligible to work in the city of New York. So now this has to be in our wheelhouse. We have to take a stand. We can't operate in this state of panic forever. We have to restore the authority of this body. And I'm asking you as colleagues to take a stand on the issue. Join me in the resolution. Say you don't support the mandates and the treatment of our city employees and our private sector employees as pariahs. They can't work in this city. What are they going to do? They're going to leave. Or don't sign on to the resolution, but at least have the courage to say to your neighbors, I don't want you to work in this city anymore. We don't value your performance of the job that up until a few months ago, we actually did value. So I ask you, friends and colleagues, please sign on to Intro 106. Please support having a hearing on this. Please support, at the very least, just having a hearing on this so the health commissioner could come here and explain how basketball players are less threatening to the public from COVID spread than the person selling hot dogs. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Leader Borelli. I'm not sure Mets fans would say they have the best doctors, but to each their own. Uh, well, we'll, we will now go to uh, the minority whip, Sylvina Brooks Powers. Thank you, majority. <laughs> majority, but thank you, majority leader. <laughs> um, first, as uh, my colleagues have already shared, I'd like to acknowledge the tragic shooting that took place in the 36th Street station and council member of Vilas's district earlier this week. I am relieved that no victims were fatally injured and I wish them all a quick recovery. As we encourage New Yorkers to resume using our subways and buses at pre-pandemic levels, we must restore riders' confidence that the system is safe. Our constituents deserve to commute without fear of physical harm. According to the NYPD, surveillance cameras in the 36th Street stations, turnstile area were malfunctioning during the incident, and there are no cameras on the platform. Surveillance cameras in adjacent stations were also not transmitting video at the time. These gaps prolonged the search for the suspect and potentially put many more people in danger. That's why Speaker Adams, Finance Chair Brannon, and I sent a letter to MTA Chair Jano Lieber this morning. We are requesting the MTA to submit to the council a full report of the agency's surveillance network. The number of cameras installed, installed in the system, their placement within stations, whether each camera stores footage locally or in the cloud, and the agency's inspection and maintenance schedule. This information will allow the council to ensure our constituents that the MTA is working to keep the subway safe. I also wanted to highlight three resolutions which I have submitted for introduction today. One resolution calls for the MTA to make permanent the Atlantic Ticket Pilot, a successful fair capping program that has provided lower cost tickets to commuters across the LIRR network. Unfortunately, the fair pilot has not been extended to my constituents in Far Rockaway, who are still paying full fares to commute within the city. I urge the MTA to extend this pilot to a community that would strongly benefit from more affordable and faster commutes. My other two resolutions call for a continued evaluation of the proposed Interborough Express and for more frequent rush hour service and adjusted train schedules for distant subway terminal lines. I look forward to continue working with my colleagues to elevate their constituents' transportation issues. And I encourage you to join me as co-sponsors on these important items. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to go to Councilmember Gennaro, followed by Councilmember Vernikov, <coughs> and Councilmember Russell. Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Majority Leader. Uh, I have some good news uh, today. Uh, about two hours ago, the uh, State Public Service Commission uh, voted to uh, move forward with the two Tier 4 um, renewable energy projects. Uh, 
We had a sign on letter uh, from the Environmental Protection Committee. Then we did another one from the council at large. Uh, and the um, and the PSC, uh, you know, took the right step in um, moving forward with those projects. Uh, combined, it would be about 4,200 4, megawatts of renewable power. That's about a third of the city's demand. Uh, the city now is about 90 percent, uh, uh, about 90 percent powered by uh, fossil fuels. And, um, and yes, this is about carbon and climate, but it's much more about uh, clean air, people that live around uh, power plants. These have been uh, you know, neighborhoods that have suffered um, environmental injustice for uh, decades. And uh, we're very uh, pleased that the uh, uh, you know, PSC has taken this step. I'd like to uh, thank this council and the, and, and the speaker of the council uh, and my colleagues on the Environmental Protection Committee and the members of the council at large that signed the letter. Also, the Adams administration, the uh, you know, League of Conservation Voters, uh, the um, environmental justice community, uh, the environmental community uh, and uh, much of um, organized labor that was uh, behind this. So this is a good day, at least when it comes to renewable energy in New York City. Thank you. Thank you. And I go to Councilmember Vernica, followed by Councilmember Ressler. Thank you. First of all, I'd like to express my condolences to Councilmember Aviles and all the victims of the horrific act of terror that took place in Sunset Park this Tuesday, but I also would like to thank all our brave police officers who risk their lives to protect us every single day. We need more police, police officers on our subways, not less. Today, I also rise to support the minority leader's resolution seeking to rehire those employees which were fired for noncompliance with the city's vaccine mandate. Several weeks ago, the mayor exempt professional athletes from the mandate and allowed them to continue playing their sport. Exempting those athletes rightfully gave them the opportunity to continue making a living. But most professional athletes are not of poor means. Their standard of living is already way above those of the middle class. It's way above teachers, police officers, firefighters, nurses, and just the average New Yorkers. It is neither scientific nor equitable to exempt athletes, but not the average New Yorkers. Athletes do not have an immune system that protects them from the pandemic better than it does everyone else. They are just as susceptible to both getting and spreading COVID-19. This council is all about equity, and there is no equity in exempting one class of people and not the other. It's not scientific to exempt athletes, but not teachers athletes but not nurses, athletes but not members of the law enforcement. These New Yorkers need to put bread on their table and feed their families. It is discriminatory to single them out for their personal health choices. We are on the eve of the Jewish holiday of Passover. On Passover, we celebrate freedom from slavery and we repeat the saying, let my people go. But today I would like to say, let New Yorkers work. Ramadan Mubarak, Happy Easter, and Chag Pesach Sameach. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to Councilmember Ressler. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, firstly, my heart is with Councilmember Aviles and the Sunset Park community, and of course, Ramadan Mubarak, season Pesach, and Happy Easter to all. Uh, I wanted to just speak briefly today about the very concerning news put out by the Rent Guidelines Board. Uh, earlier today, they released their preliminary ranges, and this is an issue that affects each and every one of our districts. Indeed, we have over a million rent-regulated apartments in New York City, and the Rent Guidelines Board has just proposed draconian increases that would have massive implications for each and every one of the rent-regulated tenants in our community. Indeed, the two-year rent increases are as high as 9%. 9%. So for the family with $1,000 in rent, increased by 90 bucks, add that up over two years, they're paying thousands of dollars in additional rent over the course of, this, of, of the proposed terms. So now is the time for us to mobilize the tenants in our community to push back. Now is the time for us to speak up and speak out and to call on the Rent Guidelines Board to recognize that our city has been struggling through this pandemic, that working people can't afford these massive, absolutely unacceptable rent increases uh, now is the time to organize. So I hope that this is a call. This can be a call to action for each and every one of my colleagues. And uh, thank you very much. 
Thank you. And I go to Councilmember Brewer, followed by Councilmember Abreu and Councilmember Marte. Thank you very much. A um, couple of things. First of all, in introduction that we'll talk about establishing minimum neighborhood services when we do EISs, known as Environmental uh, Mitigation Reports, EIS is also on large-scale U of developments. I think we all know that this is a constant in our city. Um, so all development projects that go through ULIP and require environmental impact statements now will undergo, if this bill passes, review of the Departments of Education, whether or not the schools are impacted, environmental protection review, parks review, sanitation review, transportation review, and uniform services review. The City Planning Department would review the EIS and identify current level of services and provide a detailed plan of each agency's plan to address differential between current service levels and minimum neighborhood services. And of course, the reports would be uh, sent to all the relevant city agencies. This came about thanks to a report that I did with the then council members and now Brooklyn Borough President um, in January 2018 when we were talking about the challenges we were having on getting some of these issues into the EULA process. And then I also want to thank tremendously Council Member Rivera. I know she'll talk more. We're trying, all trying to figure out how do we keep vacant apartments to be actually occupied. I know there are bills that are pending also in the state legislature, but this is a way that we have come, she'll talk more about it, so that we register them and at least get the discussion going because we have 70,000 potential vacancies um, of stabilized apartments in the city of New York. Thank you very much um, for this opportunity. Thank you, now go to Councilmember Brayu, followed by Councilmember Marte. Good afternoon and thank you, Majority Leader, and thank you, Madam Speaker. Um, I am honored to be introducing my first piece of legislation today. Intro 139 is designed as a tool to understand and address one of the greatest tragedies in this COVID era, which is families scarred by the loss of a parent, grandparent, or a caregiver. Several components comprise this legislation. Number one, ACS is required to report, would be required to report, on the impact of deaths of parents and guardians during the pandemic. It would also capture critical information of young adults who have had, now had to become caregivers now for their younger siblings. And it's something that is, uh, I think, need, requires a lot of attention. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, it requires that ACS produce a assessment of the needs of the families, but also to provide a responsive uh, plan to address those needs as well. The fact remains that for every four Americans that died from COVID, one child has lost a caregiver. We can't move forward without an, an honest assessment of the impact COVID has on our families and our most vulnerable. I would like to thank Nicole Bremstedt for her hard work and insight as our bill drafter, uh, the indomitable Jaleesa Quigley, my deputy chief of staff, for her unwavering commitment to building policy to make our city uh, a better place to live. And of course, I'd like to thank Deputy Speaker Ayala, uh, not only for uh, her capacity as deputy speaker, but also as the chair of the Committee on General Welfare. I urge my colleagues to co-sponsor this important piece of legislation. Thank you so much. Thank you, and I go to Councilman Marte. Today I'm honored to introduce my first bill, Intro 175, which will end the 24-hour workday for home attendants in New York City. Every night in our city, there are thousands of home care workers who are forced to work 24-hour shifts, but only being paid for 13 hours. Growing up as a son of a home attendant, I would go days without seeing my mom as she worked 24-hour shifts. This, this took a toll on her health and on our family. And these shifts continue to inflict racist exploitations of families to this day. Two weeks ago, Xiaoling Ma, who was one of the first home attendants to sue her employer, CPC, for wage theft and forced labor, passed away. Her final message to her friend was, to this day, I still don't think I'll get my back pay. I guess I am fated to have no justice. Today, we take a step forward 
in making sure not another woman dies without getting justice. Not another child of immigrants have to grow up, grow, grow up without seeing their mom because she has to work a 24 hours a day. Home attendants are prim primarily women and women of color. And though some are union members, even they don't get back pay or protected eight hour workdays. Many of these brave women home care workers who have been fighting to end the 24 hour days have been fighting for decades. They've organized lawsuits, protested home care agencies, and now have thousands in their ranks. Their demand is simple. They want to be emancipated from this practice of modern day slavery. They want to be paid for what they are owed, provide the quality care that they train to provide, and end the shifts that give them insomnia, intense physical disabilities. Intro 175 prohibits, prohibits home care agencies from assigning home attendance shifts longer than 12 hours and consecutive 12 hour shifts. I look forward to a hearing on this urgent issue soon so that many of my colleagues can hear from these workers themselves. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to go to Councilmember Farias, followed by Councilmember Menon, Sanchez, and Ariola. Thank you, Majority Leader. March um, 26 marked the 51st anniversary of Bangladesh's independence from Pakistan. Since then, Bangladesh has been one of the largest contributors to peacekeeping operations worldwide. I'm proud that my district is home to a vibrant community of Bangladeshi immigrants who I was able to celebrate their independence with um, last month on Starling Ave due to our delayed Stated, I wanted to make sure I highlighted this important moment and applaud those who fought for their independence 51 years ago and are now hardworking New Yorkers and Bronxites. I also want to wish our city's Hindu community a belated happy Navratri. Navratri is a Hindu festival in April that spans over nine nights in celebration of Goddess Durga and all her different manifestations. I was thankful to be able to celebrate with the community at our local temple, the Vishnu Mandir. It is important for us in government not only to highlight our community, but to be present within the community too. We don't always have to understand another person's way of prayers, but respecting the way they worship and doing what you can to understand and highlight that is important for this city. Wishing everyone many blessings during this time of celebrations. I'm always grateful to be able to celebrate with folks within my community and I'm proud to represent the beautiful diversity I have in District 18. Lastly, I'm extremely saddened about an incident that happened this morning um, in my community. We had another domestic violence incident this morning where a school safety officer and a school admin was slashed with a knife at PS 69 while intervening to protect a school staff member. The suspect is in custody and there are no life-threatening injuries, thankfully. But this kind of toxic violence is unacceptable. I applaud those I applaud those who stood up for their coworker, and I'm thankful for school safety officers, the NYPD, school faculty, for taking swift action in this incident. Really though, at the core, we need to address trauma, violence against women, and how to not only assist the victims in these incidences, but also the men who perpetuate this violence. Lastly, I would just like to say thank you to all my colleagues who signed on to Reso 65. Restoring TAP made it into the New York State budget and I'm proud of all of our work leading it out here in the council. Thank you. Thank you, and I go to Councilmember Menon, Sanchez, Ariola. Thank you, Majority Leader Powers. Uh, today, I am proud to introduce, along with Council Members Shulman, De La Rosa, Abreu, and Velasquez, Resolution 115, which calls upon the New York State Legislature to pass and the Governor to sign the Hospital Equity and Accountability Law, also known as the HEAL Act. We must rein in hospital costs so that every New Yorker can access affordable health care that they deserve. The HEAL Act is aimed at preventing anti-competitive hospital contracting prices and out-of-control pricing structures that hurt patients and act as a barrier to affordable care. For example, in my district, New York Presbyterian Hospital, as well as others, are charging up to 300% of Medicare rates. This is costing the city billions of dollars a year, as well as labor unions like DC 37, 32BJ, the UFT, and others, hundreds of millions each year in excess costs. City agencies are being asked to take a 3% peg, yet the city is not reining in these out-of-control hospital costs. 
Stakeholders and unions, including the UFT 32BJ, DC 37, HTC, and Local 1500, and others have created the Coalition for Affordable Hospitals to fully support the HEAL Act. I hope you'll join me and my colleagues in supporting and signing on to Reso number 115. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to go to Councilmember Sanchez, followed by Councilmember Ariola and Hanif. Thank you, Majority Leader. Good afternoon to Speaker Adams and all of our colleagues. Uh, today, alongside nine of my fellow council members, I'm introducing Introduction 204, which addresses reinspection fees on complaints for repeat housing code violations. We're tired. We're tired of the repeated calls from our constituents about negligent landlords who deliberately withhold or refuse to provide heat and hot water to tenants address mold and other hazardous violations inside of people's homes. These landlords sometimes pay slap, a slap on the wrist fine or a fee in lieu of providing the real solutions in, the, in those homes. In the last year, myself, Council Members De La Rosa, Richardson Jordan, Joseph, Stephen Salamanca, Dinowitz, Abreu Ayala, and Feliz, we've had about 200,000 complaints for heat and hot water violations alone. This, among us, a fifth of the council, totals in about half of the citywide complaints. In my district alone, tenants have submitted a total of 22,000 heat and hot water complaints. So for many of these complaints uh, come repeat violations. That is a waste of, re of city resources as the agency goes back again and again to the same building for the same issue. And so intro 204 would increase the reinspection fee from 200, more than doubling it to 500 and giving HPD the authority to raise the repeat inspection fee to even $1,000 per inspection. Let me be clear about one thing. If you are a good landlord, this is not a problem for you. This is specifically about landlords who, per, who refuse to provide good service to tenants who pay rent and deserve a high quality of life. As we consider raising fees for these inspections, we'll also be continuing to look at HPD operations, DOB operations, and anybody in the city of New York who is responsible for keeping homes safe to identify further improvements. Thank you so much, and if, if I may, Majority Leader, I also just want to uh, join in, in expressing condolences to Councilmember Aviles and in my district, uh, just a week ago, we lost a 61-year-old woman, Doña Juana Perdomo Soriano, uh, to a stray bullet uh, due to an al unrelated altercation happening uh, near one of our busiest subway stations. Uh, Doña Juana could have been my mother. Uh, she, could have, she could have been any of our mothers. And uh, I, I just wanna express uh, my condolences to the family and join in with our colleagues to, to call for all of these guns to be removed from our streets and for us to really reinvest in the root causes of this violence. Thank you. Thank you, and now go to Captain Ariola. Thank you, Majority Leader. I would also like to say that my heart goes out to everyone who was injured yesterday in that heinous attack on the subway. But I'd also like to add that although I agree that we do need more mental health professionals and people to intervene and to work with those who have mental illness. It was not any one of those worthwhile um, professionals that arrested the person who perpetrated that crime. It was the NYPD and law enforcement. The, in the hate crime that happened as well yesterday, it wasn't anyone but the NYPD who worked hard, diligently investigating to bring two perpetrators to, into custody. We do need the NYPD, we do need law enforcement, and we do need that coupled with social programs. I'd like to now speak about Reso 106 that I'm happy to be part of with my colleagues. For nearly two years, our city workers put their lives on the line each and every day assisting other New Yorkers regardless of COVID status. Our teachers changed their lives to begin teaching remotely. Our police continued to patrol our streets. 
Our firefighters and EMS personnel responded to calls every single day, while thousands of their fellow citizens died from the virus. And how have we repaid them for their service during this critical time? By demanding that they receive a vaccine that many had deep objections to. They had those objections because of their convictions or their chronic illnesses. And thousands of people who dedicated their careers to serving the people of this city lost their jobs and their livelihoods. To add further insult to their injury, the city has recently agreed to allow athletes to play within the five boroughs regardless of their vaccination status. What a slap in the face. What kind of message does that send to the people who have given so much to the citizens of New York? Do we really prioritize a multimillionaire athlete over a teacher, a fireman, or a police officer? How can anyone justify this kind of standard? It is imperative that we give our city's workers the respect they deserve, and we return those who lost their jobs due to vaccine noncompliance back to work immediately. I'd also like to wish everyone a blessed Passover, Easter, Ramadan Mubarak, Visaki, and Navrami. Thank you for your time. Thank you. We're going to go to Councilmember Hini, followed by Councilmember Vera and Councilmember Riley. Thank you. Um, a special thank you to Councilmember Farias for acknowledging Bangladeshi victory and independence. We don't talk enough about the genocide that took place to cultivate and create an independent Bangladesh. It's not in our history books. And Bangladeshis are the fastest growing and one of the most visible faces that we see every single day in New York City. So a uh, special shout out to um, Council Member Farias and also all the members who are working so diligently to make sure that Bangladeshi residents are included in their work. And I want to extend all of my gratitude to my neighbor and sister Council Member Aviles, who has helped lead her district through this crisis with so much care, grace, and being so clear about where we need to invest urgently to make our community safer. I also want to lift up my brother Zach Tahan, a 21-year-old Syrian immigrant who, while fasting, was able to spot the shooter and help end the 30-hour search. This is an incredible example of community members coming together to support one another and immigrant New Yorkers stepping up in times mm -hmm. of crisis. I'm thrilled to be introducing Intro 158 with Council Members Krishnan, Powers, and Rivera, and Cro Co-Prime sponsoring intros 184, 185 with Council Member Powers. This legislative package would strengthen our detainer laws to ensure our city government is not funneling immigrant New Yorkers into ICE custody. I'm also grateful to partner with Public Advocate Williams to introduce Resolution 112 in support of the State New York for All Act, which would broadly prohibit state and city agencies from collaborating with ICE. New York City proudly proclaims itself a sanctuary city and passing these bills is critical in getting us to truly live up to that name. Lastly, I want to praise my colleague, Councilmember Caban, for introducing Intro 153, which I'm proud to co-prime sponsor. This bill would create a fund dedicated to providing grants and essential resources to ensure domestic violence survivors can find safe and stable housing. With the support, we can help thousands of people leave abusive situations and create a more caring and safer city for everybody. I hope members will consider joining me in supporting these bills. Thank you. Thank you, to Councilmember Rivera. Thank you so much, and thanks to Councilmember Hanif for shouting out Zach, um, who was on the streets of the East Village and made the call because New Yorkers are amazing and we look out for each other. While we meet here this afternoon, our communities are battling a housing crisis on the heels of a public health crisis. To confront these compounding crises, today I'm in introducing a legislative package addressing housing as a matter of public health and safety because it absolutely is. The Community Opportunity to Purchase Act, COPA, is a bill to accelerate affordable housing development to the expansion of CLTs and joins other bills that I'm introducing, including one to address emergency lead remediation as a Class C violation that warrants immediate action in homes with children as well as a vacant unit registry bill to tackle the challenge of warehousing in our city. This package will ensure we are supporting community-led development and expands and strengthens multiple dwelling safety requirements to protect tenants. 
New York City is, as, is at a crossroads for the future of housing justice. I hope you will join me, Council Members Sandy Nurse and Council Member Gail Brewer, in signing on. And to support our economy, especially through what we have seen happen to our small businesses throughout the pandemic, some which have closed, unfortunately. I am today introducing legislation with Council Member Menon to create a legacy business registry and preservation fund to give special designation protections and support to long-standing small businesses who have contributed so much to the character and history of their neighborhoods. For the shuttered Gem Spa, for our outstanding Casa Adela, for the local favorite and kind of famous Stromboli's Pizza, for that upcoming unnamed cannabis business that will represent the best of our intentions, and for all of the legacy businesses past, present, and future that have shaped who I am, who we are, and what we strive to protect, we must get this done. I'll also be joining Council Members Keith Powers and Shahana Hanif in introducing a critical package of legislation to protect immigrant New Yorkers. All of these bills brings us one step closer to justice that our fellow New Yorkers desperately need. Thank you. Thank you. And I go to Councilmember Riley Caban and Ose. Thank you. As you heard earlier today by my colleague Councilmember Fariz, Fariz, excuse me, the city must be set the standard for survivor protection, domestic, gender-based, and intimate partner violence. As elected officials, it is our duty to ensure that appropriate legislation exists that is conducive to maximizing the support and resources survivors rely on to maintain their healing. With the push for an online portal and the written resources guide for the mayor's office, we will create opportunities for more expansive, cultural competent outreach to survivors. I'm happy today to co-sponsor co and prime this piece of legislation with my colleagues, Councilmember Caban, Lewis, Ayala, Ung, and Public Advocate Williams, leading the charge against domestic and gender-based violence. This bill will ensure survivors feel more confident and comfortable in our relief services with the addition of, a, of this comprehensive online portal. I encourage my colleagues in the New York City Council to support this legislation, which will improve the network for survivors' resources citywide. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm gonna catch some work, come on. Thank you. Today, joined by esteemed colleagues, I am introducing the Support Survivors Legislative Package. It's a bold step towards a city where survivors of violence can find healing, growth, and safety. The first bill, intro 0153, I want to thank Council Members Hanif, Lewis, Ayala, Ung, and Public Advocate Williams for their co-sponsorship. Again and again, we hear from survivors that economic precarity is a central barrier to safety and healing. That's why the city must establish a program that provides low barrier, urgently accessible grants to survivors for whatever expenses they have, ranging from housing, medical, counseling, legal, to mobile phone costs and moving trucks. Second, intro 0154, I wanna thank council members Riley, Lewis, Ayala, Ung, and public advocate Williams for their co-sponsorship. Many times, even when the city already offers the service a survivor needs, it's hard to find, locate, and access that service. And different services are housed in different agencies and organizations, making finding one prohibitively di difficult for many survivors. And so this bill mandates the creation of an online portal and a written resource guide where all of the services offered by every agency and CBO are clearly laid out in all the major languages including Braille, all in one place. And lastly, Rezo 0111, I want to thank Public Advocate Williams for his partnership on this. Like the vast majority of my fellow New Yorkers, I support universal paid leave. However, even if it takes a while to win that, I think we can agree that survivors of domestic, intimate partner, sexual, and gender-based violence have a unique need for paid leave. For too long, this city has cynically used survivors' trauma and pain merely as a pretext to ramp up policing, prosecution, and incarceration, leaving the actual survivors without access to the services and protections that they need. No more. These are supports that are trauma-informed, survivor-centered, improve overall public safety, and on an individual level, will be life-changing for the folks who access them. And it is for all survivors, including those historically criminalized, black, brown, immigrant, trans, non-binary, the disability community, who we know are significantly more likely to be abused or assaulted. 
I hope my colleagues will join us in proudly and urgently supporting survivors in our city. Thank you. Thank you. And I go to Councilman Ose, followed by Barron and Palladino. Thank you, Majority Leader. I want to start by expressing my love and solidarity with Councilmember Velez, um, as well as my condolences uh, from the horrific attack uh, in Sunset Park a couple days ago. Um, I also do want to acknowledge that in my district on the same day, uh, three people were also shot um, in another shooting in, in Bed-Stuy. Uh, with that being said, I, I do want to acknowledge and express gratitude for both the mayor as well as colleagues in this room uh, for advocating and pushing for our federal government to stand up against the gun lobby and to truly shut down the influx and flow of guns within our city. Um, I also do want to say that over these past couple of days, I have taken the subway uh, three times. Um, every single time I've taken the subway, I have seen cops on their phone, um, and I do want to also call on this administration and my colleagues in the room too, uh, to tell this administration that before we spend more of our taxpayer dollars on sending more cops into the subway or even implementing metal detectors in our subway system, uh, that we tell the NYPD uh, and the cops that are already there, the 3,800, to get off their phones. Thank you. Thank you, and I'm going to Council Member Barron. Starting uh, time. Thank you very much. My colleagues, I want to uh, introduce you to a bill I'm introducing, Intro 143, to remediate lead hazard in water in our schools. There's lead hazards in our water that our children drink and cook with. So we got to do something about that, and my bill will require testing and remediate, uh, um, rem remedies that go along with clean cleaning this up. And the reason why I'm stumbling, because I got to get to this mayor. I cannot believe that I heard him today talking about where's the Black Lives Matter movement? How come they aren't in the streets now? Shame on you, mayor. You are trying to hide behind the fact that after 100 days, your policies have failed. There's more police on the streets. There's more police in the subways. You want to end the no-cash bail, which has nothing to do with crime going up, because the fact of the matter is crime didn't go up under no-cash bail because it was for nonviolent misdemeanors, and 98% didn't commit another crime. We need to put not lip service into mental health and to youth centers and job creation and no more jails. And we need to put the real bucks into that. Hey, Mayor, how about taking that $513 million worth of overtime that your police use and put that $500 million into the violence interrupters, not $100 million, $200 million, a half a billion. Until you adequately address the root causes of this, you know what it is. Everybody speaks to it. Put your money where your mouth is. Stop trying to go Black Lives Matter like that has something to do with it. Shame on you, Mayor. People are dying, and we need to do the real thing, get to the root causes of our problems. Poverty, Mayor, unemployment, and finance the violence interruptions to the tune of a billion, like your police 10-point-plus billion-dollar budget. Shame on you, Mayor. We're going to, to Councilmember Palladino, Councilmember Krishnan, and Councilmember Carr. Starting time. Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to address this chamber today on several different things. I'd like to start first with some common sense here. All I'm listening to right now is defund the police and get the police out of the subways. I think that's absolutely ridiculous. How can you sit here and actually, actually say we don't need police officers. That's, that's, that's ridiculous. The next thing I'd like to talk about is addressing the reinstatement of the police officers, the firefighters, and those civil servants, the average Jane and Joes who fought the, and, and were on the front lines during 2020 when this city was burning to the ground. They deserve their careers back. I stand with Joe Borelli and my other colleagues in this chamber, and I hope to God everybody could understand that violence is here. It's not going anywhere. Social workers are not the end all. We need a combination of both. 
Be wise, people, when you think and think before you speak. Because this is outrageous what I'm hearing on this floor today. And my heart and my sympathy just goes out to uh, Council Member Aviles. But I'm a realist. And what the realist is, what a realist means to me and to so many other people, to hear that council member say, police officers get off your phone? Really? How could you say that with a straight face? When people run into the subways with their guns drawn, they got their, they're wearing their, they got the guts to wear those guns and put their life on their line for people like you and people like me. And the firefighters that run into those burning buildings. You got something to say about them too? Yes, I totally agree. Social services, but we need balance here. And what I hear and see here today is extremely frustrating. There is no balance. We need balance, we need common sense. And I beg each and every one of you to look inside yourselves and get off the high horses that you're on and deal with reality. I've been around 68 years. I've watched it come, I've watched it go. Council member Barron's been around as long as I have. And we've seen the city go through different things. And we're going Thank to- Thank you, council member. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. We're now going to council member Krishnan, council member Carr, council member Feliz, council member Yeager. <laughs> and remember it's 80 degrees out. Thank you. <clears throat> Starting time. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first, I want to uh, extend my condolences, uh, my love to uh, Councilmember Aviles and all of those of, of, of Sunset Park and the victims of this uh, horrific uh, attack. Um, I couldn't agree more with Councilmember Aviles' statements and the way in which we truly need community-based solutions uh, that keep our community safe, whether it's investing in mental health services, uh, whether uh, it's engaging our youth uh, in positive and constructive ways, uh, whether it's offering true supports, permanent housing, and services for our homeless, not sweeps, uh, and uh, as well as ending the public health epidemic, which is gun violence uh, in this city. The need to address those issues could not be clear. Uh, we all stand with you. We all stand with Sunset Park. Uh, I had also, today is also the, uh, uh, or this weekend as well, there are a number of holidays uh, coming up too, so I want to wish everyone who celebrates a happy Baisaki, uh, a happy Bengali New Year, Shubo Novo Borsho, uh, happy Vishu, uh, happy Easter, happy Passover. I hope I didn't omit anything, but happy weekend and celebration to all those who celebrate these days in their different forms. Um, I wanted to uh, talk about two pieces of legislation, my two first pieces of legislation uh, that I'll be introducing today, intros 173 and 174. Uh, earlier uh, or last month at this point, uh, I joined uh, colleagues of the Parks committee to announce our five-point plan. These two bills, intro 173 and 174, help to advance the goals of parks equity in our city, which we desperately need. Intro 173 uh, will ensure that the Parks Department comes up with a rating system to grade the satisfactoriness of uh, parks and maintenance services in our parks. And those that don't meet the satisfactory criteria requires parks to submit reports to the council every six months of the plan and the timeline and the repairs that will be needed to bring the parks up to satisfaction. Uh, intro 174 uh, requires the Parks Department to also submit a, re a report on a regular basis of capital projects um, and the status of those projects and the timeline for completion, because we do know that we must reform and radically reform the capital process for parks construction uh, in this city. Uh, and finally, I'd be remiss if I did not mention again my call uh, and so many advocates that we do need $1 billion uh, for parks uh, in, uh, in, the, in the city budget. And uh, finally... Thank you. Just last thing I'll close is just to echo Councilmember Ressler's comments um, that the rent guideline boards increases at a time when so many tenants cannot pay their rent uh, is is utterly atrocious. Uh, Nine percent is is uh, is highway robbery of so many tenants who have struggled so much during this pandemic. Uh, it cannot be uh, implemented as as policy for rent stabilized tenants. Thank, Thank you, you. Councilmember. We've got a Councilmember Carr, Councilmember Feliz, and Councilmember Yeager. Thank you, Majority Leader. Uh, good afternoon, <clears throat> colleagues. I'm speaking in support of Resolution 106, of which I'm a prime co-sponsor, and, and many of my colleagues are sponsoring as well and have spoken eloquently on the subject. 
Uh, I'm supporting this resolution not simply because of the exemption offered to professional athletes, but because I don't believe that these em employees should have been terminated to begin with. There were reasonable measures that could have been taken to ensure workplace safety and workplace health, even when the mandate was put in place. And, and for all we know, the individuals who were terminated were good, able, competent, model employees of the city of New York. And I know how important workplace uh, protections are uh, in this body, how important uh, the principles of organized labor are and civil service protections, and to see these individuals terminated for a personal health decision uh, that could have been accommodated um, is to me unfortunate, and I think it needs to be reversed. And that's chiefly why I'm supporting this resolution and call on my colleagues to do the same and to support a hearing on this subject so we can really have the, the public discussion that this issue deserves and hopefully get these people back doing the good work on behalf of New Yorkers that they were doing for years. Um, I also want to just extend um, my support and, and, and my well wishes to Councilmember Aviles and all the folks in Sunset Park after the tragedy that occurred this week um, and my thanks to all the first responders for their great work and just wish a happy Easter, Bona Pasqua, Kag Pesach Samiach, and a happy Songkran to all those who are celebrating, and Ramadan Mubarak. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go to Councilmember Feliz, and to wrap us up, we'll go to Councilmember Diego. Thank you so much. I want to reiterate what many of my colleagues have mentioned. I, too, want to emphasize how concerned I am by the public safety crisis affecting our city, and especially the borough of the Bronx. Last Tuesday, we witnessed a horrible tragedy in the borough of Brooklyn. There were other tragedies in our city, including in my district. Ten, <coughs> ap approximately 10 people shot in my district in the span of two hours. Approximately 10 people of color shot in my district in the span of two hours. New Yorkers and people of color, including those living in the Bronx, should not have to live with the constant fear of having to hear the ring of those gunshots when they're leaving grocery stores, when they're leaving our schools, when they're leaving liquor stores, as we saw two days ago, three individuals shot in my district as they were leaving a liquor store. 10 individuals, approximately. Those aren't just numbers. Those numbers represent lives, some that have been lost, and others that will live the rest of their lives traumatized. Uh, so I hope that we could come together as a city as a state and as a country, it's a problem affecting our entire country, including the city of New York, including Chicago, California. Hope we could come together and find real solutions and truly, but truly resolve the problem for all neighborhoods. Thank you so much. Thank you, and we now go to Councilman Yeager. Thank you, Mr. President. Members uh, of this chamber spoke today about many heinous crimes committed in their district. My colleague uh, to the north of me, who represents a part of the neighborhood that I serve in, um, had a train station where we all know what happened there. Um, the lines that go through that travel through my district, travel through other members' districts. It's not exclusive to one member. Other members spoke about shootings in their neighborhood, about a stabbing where a school safety agent was stabbed trying to, I forgive the term, be a violence interrupter. Um, to protect an innocent person from being harmed. New York City has violence interrupters. We talk about violence interrupters, or at least others talk about violence interrupters all the time. The violence interrupters in the city are the police. Those are the violence interrupters. It's not mutually exclusive to say we need police and we need mental health services. We need police and we need youth programs. We need police and we need social services. Those are not concepts that, are, that contradict each other. But to say that we don't need police and we only need these other things prejudges that every single person who does something bad in this city necessarily has mental problems. There are people who do bad things who are core evil. They're just evil. They're bad people. They shoot, they kill, they stab. They're doing bad things because they're bad. And a civilized society has to has to have a measure by which we separate the good from the evil. That's the police. That's the justice system. 
Those who are unfortunately on the streets, who have clear mental problems, who are not being served by the mental services that the city provides and need more services should get those services. That's something that it doesn't matter what spectrum you fall on or what neighborhood you come from, we can all agree on in this chamber. But the idea that it's exclusive, that we don't need, I don't, think, I don't know if I heard that on the floor today, so I'm not attributing that to any member, but that we don't need more cops on the subway, but we do need mental health services, we do need social services, is, is truly an insane concept. We have to have cops on our subways. We can't have a subway system where it is simply not patrolled. When we know there is core evil in this city where there are people attacking other people because they're simply bad. And I think it's also clear, I mean, I've read as many articles and I've watched as much TV as anybody else over the last couple of days. I don't know that we've heard that this gentleman has mental problems. I don't know that we heard, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't know that we heard that he was released from a psychiatric institution, that he had sought services, that he had mental problems. We do know that he has a criminal history. We do know that he got on a train Clock with expired. weaponized and he Thank you, intended to do harm and he did the harm and he was caught by the police with the help of New Yorkers who called in the tips line. And for that, we're very grateful. Thank you very much, Mr. President. Thank you. And that is the end of general discussion. <laughs> I'll now call on Speaker Adrian Adams to close out today's state of meeting. The state of meeting of April 14th, 2022 is hereby adjourned. Thank you.